Good morning. We want to welcome you to this simulated live worship service. We are glad that you have chosen to join us. And we want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. We also want to celebrate all women who are walking with Jesus. We are grateful for you. And while we celebrate this day, we also want to be sensitive to the fact that this is a difficult day for many. Many moms have lost children. Other women have wanted to have children and haven't been able to. Some have lost their moms. Some moms have kids who are not walking with the Lord. And for those reasons and many others, this can be a very difficult day, and we want to be sensitive to that. At the same time, we want to celebrate women who are walking with Jesus, and we want to celebrate the moms in our lives. I'm grateful for the women that God has put in my life, for my mom, for my wife, for my mother-in-law, for my sister. I'm grateful for them. And so as we get started today, let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for the women that you have given us, for the moms and for the women of faith. And we ask your special blessing on them today. God, we pray that you bless this whole service. We pray, Lord, that your name would be glorified in it. And we pray, God, that you would do great things in the life of the church at Tubac. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, to the ladies of the church at Tubac, you should have received a card sometime this week. And you had instructions on that card not to open it until sometime during the service as instructed today. And so right now, you have permission to open those cards. And it's a, just a small gift of appreciation from our church for all the ladies in our church. We appreciate you. You are of great value to our church, to your families, to your communities. And we are grateful for you. So you can go ahead and open those. We're going to go here into a video but may God bless you on this Mother's Day. Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. Nah, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah. Thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The mom personal assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you.
Mother's Day. I'm going to be reading from Proverbs 31, 10 through 21. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night, and gives food to her household, and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength, and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good, her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet.
She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Mm -hmm. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates.
On this day when we as a church honor moms and women of faith, perhaps sheltering at home has caused us to appreciate the women in our lives even more. The Board Panda website had some funny pictures of parenting at home during this quarantine. We're going to show you some of those now. I think the Spider-Man one is great, very creative. Then you can see the mom trying to get some work done at the computer. Assuming that the kids have been loud, they are now taped to the floor and their mouths are taped shut as well. And then you see the kid who apparently has given himself a haircut and even allowed mom to take a picture of it, mom or dad. And uh, that picture will probably be popular for years to come in that family. And then finally, as difficult as it has been to get toilet paper, apparently one child thought it would be a good idea to give the toilet paper a bath. So this Mother's Day is unique for us. I can tell you it has caused us probably to appreciate Amanda much more. I can tell you that the Hatfield kids would have been a lot hungrier during this sheltering at home without Amanda making so many good meals. The word mom gets uttered a lot in our house. One of Amanda's least favorite questions is when one of the kids will ask her where another of the kids are in the house. She's like that personal assistant from the video that we showed earlier. She can't understand, one, why they won't just look for them themselves, and two, why they think she knows where everybody is at all times in the house. I've worked from home even more over the last two months, and the kids will often come to me asking where mom is. I'm assuming from them that they assume that she will be much more helpful than I am. And so today we honor moms. We honor women of faith in our church. The women of faith in our church, in our houses, are of great value. And so we're going to look at a text where we see some ladies who have great spiritual influence. And we're going to make some points here, but I hope these points are applicable to all of us in some way in the church. I'm going to read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, and then turn over to chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. 2 Timothy 1, verse 3 I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience as my ancestors did when I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am convinced is in you also. And in chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil people and impostors will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you... Continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would 
Use your word today in the hearts and lives of your people. Father, we pray that you would bless those who are listening and draw us closer to you in faith. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, here in this text, Timothy's mom and grandma are featured as examples of a vibrant Christian faith. Now, I'm preaching a Mother's Day sermon. I don't want to miss the main point of the text. And the main point of the paragraph I read to you from 2 Timothy 1 is Paul is highlighting the sincerity of Timothy's faith. Now, I suspect that Paul and Timothy were very different people. Timothy likely had a very different personality than Paul. He was probably much more timid, wasn't as bold as Paul, but his faith is every bit as genuine. And then Paul kind of pulls the curtains back on Timothy's upbringing, and we see two of Timothy's spiritual influencers, and that's his mom and his grandma. They were examples of, of putting Christ first in their lives. These were Jewish women who heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, believed that Jesus was along the way to Messiah, put their faith in him, and pursued the lordship of Jesus Christ in their lives. Now, Paul used the phrase here, I recall your sincere faith that first lived in these ladies. Now, I think that lived in phrase is intentional, and it's meant to show a deep faith. This is the same word that's used later on in verse 14, speaking of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. God dwells in his people. His presence defines the church. So the spirit indwelling the believer characterizes the believer. So I understand from that that Mamma Lois, Mama Eunice here, their lives were defined by their Christian faith. Their lives were transformed. They weren't nominal Christians. They weren't surface level Christians. Their faith isn't at the fringe of their lives. Their faith was foundational to all they are and all they do. We could say they're the real deal. Now, I think this is instructive to all of us. Not just moms, but let your faith define you. Put the gospel at the center of your life. Live completely devoted to Jesus. See, this is Paul's last letter. And the reason Paul writes is to encourage Timothy to endure in gospel ministry. To stand against false teaching. To live as an example. To preach the word. And Paul has held up Timothy as a model of how to live out the faith. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 and following, here's what Paul wrote. Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, so that I too may be encouraged by news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character, because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Now that is high words about Timothy. So that's who he is. But how did his character develop? How was the faith modeled to him? Who were his examples? Well, in Acts 16, we learn specifically that Timothy was the son of a Jewish woman who had become a believer in a Gentile man who likely had not. Verse 1, a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Now, most commentators don't believe that Timothy's dad ever became a Christian. So Timothy's early spiritual examples were his mom, Eunice, and his grandma, Lois. Verses 2 and 3 of Acts 16, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. So you know, as Timothy is growing in his faith, his faith is being noticed by other believers, so much so that Paul takes notice and wants Timothy to go along with him on his missionary travels. Now that's huge. And Luke, I don't think, records details randomly. 
Luke is a rigorous historian. And so there's a reason I think he's discussing Timothy's mother in light of the context of Paul taking Timothy on missionary travels. Luke seems to show that Timothy's Christian faith has much to do with the influence of his mother. Now, you think about this male-dominated society of the time. It wasn't common to praise women in a letter. But Paul does that here in 2 Timothy very clearly. Now, Paul didn't just give random shout-outs in Scripture. He doesn't just put their names in here so that these names could be cut out and put in a scrapbook. No, he's not doing that. Their names are brought out because much of Timothy's upbringing and his spiritual roots come from these two ladies. Moms, your example is crucial. How blessed are kids who can see a faith lived out day after day by moms who are modeling Christian faith over time. So our first point here today is the important example of Christian moms. Lois and Eunice set a godly example, and we're going to see in a moment they provide a, a, a biblical education for young Timothy. So they both modeled the faith and they taught the faith. They want their lives to say what their lips had been saying. Now I doubt in, in this first century world that the names Lois and Eunice were going viral. They weren't trending like many women of faith today. They were probably unknown to most of the world. They're quietly living out their faith, setting a great example to Timothy and others. Now let me be clear. Timothy doesn't inherit the Christian faith like he may have inherited hair color or how tall he would be from Lois and Eunice. None of us are going to be Christians just because we are born into Christian families. We must make a commitment of faith ourselves. But instead, it seems to be that Paul is showing here the example that these ladies set that deeply impacted Timothy's faith. In the next chapter, Paul told Timothy, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So he's talking about disciple making. They pass on the faith to others who are going to take that faith and pass it on as well. Well, maybe one of the reasons Timothy could hear that instruction and do it so well is that he had seen that modeled in his own life by Lois and Eunice. Their faith seems to be the most significant part of their lives. Now, we don't know all about Timothy's mom. We don't know whether she was a, a morning person or a night owl. We don't know which brand of clothing uh, she most liked wearing. We don't know whether she liked shopping at Fry's or Safeway better. But we do know that her faith was central to her life. She was living out the gospel. So in this section where we're talking about the power of example, let me illustrate that with contrasting examples of two women separated by about 2,000 years. First, negative example. If you tuned in last week to our Simulate Live worship service, I preached on Ananias and Sapphira. So Sapphira is the negative example. We saw that they were hypocrites. They were intentionally deceiving the church, see that they have lied to the Holy Spirit. We see that swift judgment came on them from God. So that's a hypocritical, negative example. And it's a tragic one that God allowed for us to see on the pages of Scripture, at least for an example for us to avoid. It's certainly not an example for us to emulate. Well, the, the positive example that I want to contrast that with, though, is Karen Eubank. Last night I watched 
I uh, think it was uh, not last night, last Friday night, I watched the Free Burma Rangers movie. Last Friday or two weeks ago, getting the days mixed up. You can probably identify that with that uh, throughout these eight weeks or so of sheltering at home. But I watched that Free Burma Rangers movie. And Karen Eubank is really not the main character in it. Her husband, David Eubank, would go and, and into these dangerous areas and he would bring medical supplies and, and try to, to supply aid in these very dangerous and, and conflict and often combat situations. And he was doing that all in service to the gospel. So his family had been in Burma for years where there was this uh, long-term civil war going on. And then he went to Mosul, Iraq. And there was a vicious attack by ISIS on Iraqi forces. And you see David Eubank in that, and he's walking toward this, this very dangerous situation, putting himself in harm's way, bullets flying around him, uh, some of them even hitting him in different circumstances. And that's a, that's a courageous man. And that's doing a ministry few could do. But, you know, with, with him, I, I, I can kind of get it. You know, he was a guy who served in the military. He was trained as a special forces guy. I think maybe he was a special forces guy for about a decade. So even though I don't think this is a natural faith, what he's doing, I still think God is filling him with faith to do that. But with this background, I can understand it a bit more. It seems like he was more geared toward that. But his wife, Karen, she's not special forces. She's not military trained. But there she is, often really close to the fighting. In fact, in Iraq, she and her three kids were about a mile from the front lines. She homeschools, uh, or she homeschooled or does continue to her kids uh, near very dangerous areas. Says she ran a good life club where Health care is often provided, and there's gospel encouragement that is given. She's often ministering to kids uh, during, uh, during these times. An LA Times article described their li lifestyle as a combination of an episode of MASH and the Waltons. Now, I thought about just the gospel dedication of this woman who is living out her faith in the midst of great danger, challenging situations, and raising her kids in the midst of that danger. What an example of a life devoted to God and devoted to the gospel where she would go where she felt that God called them regardless of the safety and the potential dangers there. Now, I'm not saying all our ladies should consider going where bullets are flying to really prove their faith. That's not the point. The point is, are our lives, not just our ladies, but all of our lives devoted to Christ? Is the gospel central in our lives? So one, we want to be an example. But we also, in our spheres of influence, want to educate in the faith. And so when we come over to chapter 3, Paul again is, I think, referring to these two ladies who influenced Timothy spiritually. Now, the structure of this section includes two strong contrasts by the phrases in verse 10, but you, and then verse 14, but as for you. So Paul is introducing a strong contrast to what has preceded those areas. And here's the context. There are false teachers who profess to be Christians, but are, but are leading immoral lives, and they're not teaching right doctrine. And in doing so, they keep people from coming to the truth of the gospel. So Paul wants to make clear, Timothy, you are not to be like those guys. Timothy, you're to be the opposite of those guys. So verse 10, that first, but you, after that, Paul will note how Timothy had followed his model of the character of that he had Paul, as well as the suffering that he would endure. Then verse 13, 
He warns that evil people will keep on deceiving. Then he comes to that second, but as for you, in verse 14, here's what he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul urges Timothy to continue in the future. Now you see in verse 10, you have follow. He is saying that's, that's what you have done in the past, and that's right, that's good, you have done that. And then verse 14 calls him to endure in the future in the same way. Now, so he's shown here, here's what you don't want to be, Timothy. Don't be like these false teachers. Be a man of God. Live out your faith. Don't live immorally. So how can Timothy live a life of integrity and teach people rightly? Well, in two ways. And so in verse 14, remember the people who have influenced you spiritually, who have educated you spiritually. And then verses 15 through 17, live in the word of God. Live in God's inerrant, infallible word. So the main focus is continue. That's the main word here. So we could say endure. Well, how do you endure? You cling to God's word. And you follow the example of the people that God has put in your life that are living out the faith. Now, where did Timothy learn the word? From Paul? Yeah. But not first. He followed the example of Paul's teaching, but his earliest teachers were once again Lois and Eunice, grandma and mom. Now, you think about this time. And I'm sure in this area... Uh, these false teachers may be popular at that place. You know, we can imagine our days, maybe, they're, maybe their pictures are up on billboards. Maybe they're standing room only availability to hear them speak. But Paul says, no, avoid them, avoid all that. And instead, follow those who have taught you from childhood. These unknown to the women world, mom and grandma, Follow what they have taught you. These ladies who, when they heard the good news about Jesus, saw that he was the Messiah, trusted in him. They had this Old Testament background as Jewish women. So they knew the Old Testament. That's like what they were teaching him. And this probably would have begun when, when Timothy was about five years old. And, and they, they seemed to just keep raising him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Hey, kids that are listening to this sermon today, if you have parents who are believers, for whom the gospel is central in their lives, and who are teaching you the word of God, you have such a great treasure. You are so blessed in that. And parents, we have no more important job than to live out and teach our faith. Not or... Not live out or teach our faith, both. Live out and teach. Proverbs 1.8 says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and don't reject your mother's teaching. So the young man is told to listen to mom and dad, which implies that mom and dad are teaching. And the verse right before that says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So whatever else we teach our kids, let's make sure that we are teaching them the faith. The other day, the battery in our van went out. We needed to use jumper cables to get it started. And I thought that was a great opportunity to teach the older boys how to use jumper cables to start a car. And I think that's good, and that's right. They need to know car maintenance. But I don't teach them how to care for their car and not to care for their souls. I need to teach them how to care for their car in addition to not in place of the Word of God. The Word of God is first. These other things come later. Let's keep God's Word central to our lives and let's make sure we're passing that faith on to our children. And to all the moms who are doing this day in, day out, through the mundane moments of life, 
where you're often discouraged, today I want you to be encouraged. Your example is crucial. I think there's a world that's sick of hypocrisy, it gets tired of surface level Christianity. If your kids are seeing you live out your faith in a genuine faith, in a genuine way, over the course of their lives, it has impact. When I was a child, like all kids, I'm guessing, or most kids, you didn't want to get up for school any earlier than you had to. You would rather sleep till the last possible minute and then head off to school. But my mom had other plans. She would wake my sister and I up earlier than what we absolutely had to so that she could read the Bible and pray over us. Can you imagine that? Amanda does, does so much to teach our kids God's Word. I often hear them uh, beginning their homeschooling days by first reading the Bible together. I remember a few years ago, uh, they were working on the older two boys and Amanda, working on memorizing the book of James. And they got a lot of the book memorized. That was so impressive and encouraging. The atheist Richard Dawkins, who's hostile to Christianity, calls Christian religious indoctrination a form of child abuse. Well, if he had called CPS on my mom and Amanda over the issue of teaching their kids the Christian faith, there would have been plenty of evidence that they were indeed teaching the faith to their kids. So teach your children the faith in a way that would bother Richard Dawkins. Listen, somebody's going to teach your kids. The world wants to teach your kids. So yes, much is caught. Maybe we can say, we've said this at times, more is caught than is taught. And that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Our example means a lot. But also, be intentional to teach the faith to your kids. Don't be passive in that area. Susanna Wesley has been called the mother of Methodism because of two of her sons, John and Charles. They were instrumental in impacting the church for decades and, and even centuries. Now, John is one of the best-known preachers probably the last 300 years. It's estimated that he rode 250,000 miles on horseback and preached over 40,000 sermons. Now, Charles also preached, but is best known for writing hymns. It's estimated that he wrote somewhere around 7,500 Christian hymns. Now, the faith of John Wesley and Charles Wesley was impacted by their mom's example. Now, Susanna was mother to 19 children. And her life was devoted to Christ. She committed to teaching her children to fear the Lord. She would spend time regularly with each of her children, and much of that was about the Christian faith, or, or often that was about the Christian faith. John was the 15th child. Charles the 18th. And yet Susanna had a great influence on their lives because she modeled and taught the faith. We can see much the same way with Grandma and Mama to Timothy. Moms, continue to live out your faith. And may we all do that. May we, in our spheres of influence, teach the faith as we are supposed to. So let me conclude, finally, with this point about enduring. Be examples, educate in the fear of the Lord, and endure in your faith. We said that Timothy was called to continue, to endure. One of the ways he could do that was look at the example of faith of Lois and Eunice, but mainly by being anchored in the scripture that they had taught him. Paul could say from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures. So they were teaching him from early on. Now remember, Paul warned Timothy 
about these false teachers who resisted the truth, who were deceiving, didn't teach truth. But as for you, Timothy, continue. How do we do that? Well, we remember for him, remember the impact of these two women, unknown to the world, who brought you up in the faith. They taught you God's word. Anchor your life in God's word. You have deep roots spiritually. Paul concludes this section by saying all scripture is inspired, literally breathed out by God, and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. And then gives the result of that. We're equipped for every good work. So Timothy, anchor your lives in the scripture that these ladies have taught you. Now I'm sure that life brought challenges for Eunice. After all, she had an unbelieving husband. Yet she continued on in the faith. And she raised a son who, according to chapter 1, verse 4, brought great joy to the apostle Paul. So yes, Timothy learned from Paul. Paul, you know, if, if, if we have Christian preachers, if we have a Mount Rushmore of Christian preachers, historically, Paul's probably on that Mount Rushmore of Christian preachers. So Timothy learned from him, and that's great, but he first learned from Lois and Eunice. Virtual unknowns in that court culture, yet God has recorded their names in Holy Scripture. So moms, understand your example means so much. Keep living the faith. Continue your daily ministry that God has given you. You're teaching your kids. In the mundane moments of your life, you're still teaching your kids. Do that in good times. Do that in hard times. Many of the women in faith we see in Scripture went through some really difficult times. Read about Timothy's mother. Read about Hannah, who was barren for a long time. In the book of 1 Samuel, you have Jesus' mother, Mary. Talk about the Proverbs 31 woman. We are struck by the faith of these women, the things that they do. But I think undergirding that is the character they have and their, their desire to put God at the center of their lives. So as they went through these difficult times, Hannah, when she was barren for so long, when, when Mary got this message from the angel as a, as a teenager, Eunice married to a man who wasn't a believer, each of them kept trusting in God in those hard times and endured in their faith. Moms, I'm confident that many of the fears of your children throughout this pandemic have subsided because of your influence, because of watching your example. We as parents, we as Christians, must live out our faith and talk about our faith. And it matters. You may be far from the spotlight, a spotlight, but as you walk in obedience to God, it matters. Moms to your Husband, children, co-workers, neighbors, it matters. May we all endure, may we all persevere as we're committed to God's word. May we love God's word. Moms, parents, church attenders, members, those who are watching this service that I may not even know about, love the word of God. We as a church want to be a Bible preaching church. We want to be a Bible living church. We want to be a Bible-loving church. Let us persevere. Let us endure. Continue in what you have learned. And as we're closing, moms, you're so influential in that. You may not be familiar with the name J. Gresham Machen, but he made a significant contribution to the church. In 1923, he wrote a crucial book in the 20th century, Christianity and Liberalism. In it, he argued against the theological liberalism of his day. 
And that theological liberalism will reject some of the most basic tenets of the Christian faith. It would reject things like the inerrancy of Scripture, reject things like the blood atonement of Christ, reject things like the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And so those are not peripheral issues in terms of Christianity. These are at the heart of what it means to be a Christian, to reject the death and resurrection, the substitutionary death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is really to reject the Christian faith. And so Machen argued that theological liberalism is not Christianity, but something else entirely. He said this, Liberalism on the one hand and the religion of the historic church on the other are not two varieties of the same religion, but two distinct religions proceeding from altogether separate roots. So why would I bring up J. Gresham Machen on Mother's Day? Well, this man, one of the great defenders of Orthodox Christianity against this theological liberalism, actually studied in Germany where this movement had begun. And he was very much influenced by the liberal theologians that he studied under. And at first... He was drawn to it. He was torn between orthodox Christianity, true Christianity, and this new theological liberalism. In the midst of his struggle, his mother was instrumental in drawing him back to biblical faith. Machen says what kept him on track was his parents' instruction, his mother's faith and prayers. Machen wrote about his mother. I do not see how anyone could know my mother well without being forever sure that whatever else there may be in Christianity, the real heart of Christianity is found in the atoning death of Christ. And on the dedication page of this, his most well-known book, were three words. To my mother. Moms, your lives, your faith, your prayers may impact your children and this world more than you ever know. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this opportunity to preach your word once again. And I will pray specifically for moms that you would encourage them. I pray, God, for them that uh, you would fill them with your spirit to continue to live out their faith and to teach their faith. And Lord, not just for moms, for all women of faith, I pray that you would encourage them. Encourage them to be examples in those areas and among those people that you allow them to. But not just to women of faith, for all of us who have faith in Jesus, God. May we be examples of the faith. May we educate others in the faith as we we share good news of Jesus. And God, may we endure in the faith by being rooted in your word, by trusting in Jesus Christ alone, and being led by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, I want to thank you for joining us today. We're grateful that you have watched our simulated live worship service. And as we close, once again, happy Mother's Day. May God bless you.